Okay, welcome to the second talk in the session uh, given by Flavio Percocco on OpenStack. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Does it work? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, hello, everyone. Um, today's talk, well, my talk, is about system integration. It's not actually 100% related to OpenStack. It's mostly related to integrating systems uh, to each other. And I'll use OpenStack as an example because most of the methods I will present to you are being used by OpenStack itself to integrate all the services that we're using. So that's me. That's my Twitter handler. Uh, pretty much everything you want to know about me is out there in the internet. Uh, something you, I want you to know, I work for Red Hat and I'm part of the RDO community. RDO is uh, a community of a bunch of really great people working together to make OpenStack amazing on, on rel-based distributions. Other things about me, I'm not going to go through those. The one I will mention is I'm a, a Google Summer of Code and OPW mentor. And I wanted to mention this because I really believe it's very important. And if you have spare time in your day and you want to mentor people, please sign up. We need more mentors there. So let's get to it. Uh, before we go through the methods uh, that you would use to integrate systems, uh, let's first define a little bit what system integration means. Uh, system integration is basically what you do when you have a set of subsystems and you want to make them work together towards a common goal or scope, right? So all the methods and technologies and strategies that you would use to make those systems work together and to get towards that goal uh, is what we call system integration. This is put in a very simple way. Uh, there are a whole bunch of different definitions of system integration. You can integrate systems. Systems are not necessarily software. You could use hardware as a system. You could use many other things as a system. So system is a very generic term that you would use to say that you have a set of subsystems working together uh, for a single cause, so to speak. There are many different um, generic strategies to integrate systems. Uh, these are the three that I will present very briefly, and we will dive a little bit more on the last one. Uh, so vertical integration, vertical, in vertical integration uh, means, or basically looks like uh, the small graph uh, up here. It looks like, uh, like stairs. Basically, you have a set of systems, and you will talk to the system. So the system, the system that are above will talk to the system that are below. And this is done based on each subsystem features and what you need from them. So you have a web service that integrates to your database. And then you have two systems that are working together. Or you will have your authentication service, and then you will have your other services below it. And you will make this service with the real features talk to your authentication service, and you are integrating those two services vertically. The star integration, uh, well, it's called star integration because it's supposed to be like a star, but it's more like spaghetti integration because all services know what other services do, and they all talk together, and they do that in a case-by-case -case basis. So you have service A that needs something from service B, but before doing that, it talks to service C because it needs something from service C before getting to service B. So it's quite a mess. Um, use cases for this, there are plenty of them, uh, but it's very risky and it's very, very error prone. And there's for sure a very high risk of not having a contract when you're talking, when those services are talking together. Uh, not having a contract is basically means that you don't know what you're going to get back and you don't know when something can go wrong when you get something from service C to talk to service B, but service B is expecting something different and it turns out that service C was updated. Um, and the other method that we're going to dive a little bit more today is horizontal integration. And it's based on a service bus, and service bus is, I call it communication bus. Um, I don't like to use the term messaging bus here because it doesn't matter. I mean, it's not about messaging itself, but about making those services communicate together through the same bus. So you have service A, service B, and service C, and they all communicate through this communication bus, sending either messages or just a data asset uh, that will make uh, the whole feature work through this communication bus. 
So diving a little bit more on horizontal integration from an application's uh, point of view. So how would you make all these? So imagine that you have a set of applications that you want to make them work together. Uh, you need to have these communication bars. So you have to come up with an idea, with a technology that you would use to make them talk together. Uh, what I'm going to do now, I will present like four different methods for, yeah, four different methods to make those applications talk together. And these are not new methods. They are actually been around for a long time. Many people use them and they actually don't know that they are basically integrating system and they actually don't know what the whole thing they're doing means. Um, and each one of these cases are good for very, sorry, uh, each one of these methods are good for very specific cases. Uh, some of them are more generic and others are more specific. And the first one is, uh, sorry, and the first one is files. Uh, files is, it's probably, it's probably the oldest way to integrate uh, uh, different services talking together. Like for a long time, people used to open a file, uh, get a file descriptor, put something in there, and having another application within the same piece of hardware reading out of it a data asset that it will use to do something. So some people would use files too. Uh, we use files as a messaging bus, like you would use a RabbitMQ right now, so a messaging broker. Uh, it's good for very specific cases. Uh, try not to use it. It's good for cases like embedded systems. In an embedded system, you won't have RabbitMQ running for sure. So if you have very limited hardware and very limited processor and memory, you probably want to use something that's really cheap. Files are cheap. Uh, definitely accessing the file system has a cost. Um, it has a high risk in terms of security and, and reliability. But it works, for, it works very well for embedded systems. Um, we used to use these uh, files. We used to use files in OpenStack to have some kind of in-server distributed log for some time. Uh, many things went wrong with that, so don't do it. Uh, we're now working on another way to have distributed logs. But that's one of the cases where, for example, in OpenStack, we used files. And, and we moved away from them because, like I said, they're very good for hardware that has very limited resources. But if you can afford something more expensive, you probably want to do that. Databases. Databases are probably one of the most common. Um, and by the way, all these statements are based on my own experience. I don't have really actual data that prove that these are, this is the most common or the files are the most oldest. So this is all by, based on my experience and my own researches. Um, databases are probably the most common way to integrate services. They are asynchronous data-wise. What that means is that when you have a message and you want another service to get that message, you would just store it in the database and you are done with it. So the producer stores the message in the database, the producer is done with the message, and then the consumer eventually will get that data out of the database and would do something with it. Uh, databases are really great for storing states, and I'm saying this is probably the most common one because I, like, most of the web services out there, like, I couldn't think about a web service that it does not rely on a database. And if you want to scale your web service, you definitely have, or most probably have a single database for your whole thing, and you have several services talking to that database and getting data out of there, right? Um, and they're great, great, very great for states. And the way we use this in OpenStack is, in OpenStack, most of the services, or probably the biggest services, uh, have, uh, have, have been split in, in several smaller services. So in Nova, for example, Nova is the computer. How many of you know OpenStack or have heard of it? Awesome. So Nova is the service that is responsible to spawn in new instances, virtual machines. So it probably is like EC2 for AWS. Um, and Nova has three sub-services, or well, have, it has many more than that, but the, the, ma the main services that you need from Nova are like three or four services. And you have the API service, you have the compute, uh, the compute node, and you have the, the scheduler, and you have conductor that gets messages and stores everything on the database. So when a, when a request for a new instance comes into the Nova API service, a new record will be created in the database, and then a message will be sent to the scheduler that will, then will talk to the, um, to the Nova compute node to spawn the new virtual machine. 
So what Nova Compute does is it gets the data of these new instances that were requested out of the database. Uh, it spawns the new virtual machine, and when the virtual machine is running, it will update the state of the virtual machine, saying that, hey, the virtual machine is running, and it will update the data. So that's system integration in a really small scale. And that's a way you could use databases to integrate systems. So that's why you say that um, they're probably the most common way to integrate systems, and, and probably many people don't know that they're actually integrating systems by using databases. Stuck. So LibreOffice is, there you go. I hate you, LibreOffice. So does any of you have any questions so far? Feel free to interrupt me if you have questions. Like LibreOffice is stuck. Okay, finish. Asshole. So messaging. Um, what, I be my, what I mean by messaging here is not a broker, is not NQP, and is not um, the specific technology that allows you to send a message from point A to point B. What I, mean about what I mean about messaging here is the message itself, like the message as a unit to send data from point A to point B. Um, whatever method you use to send that message from point A to point B, uh, the benefits of using messaging is that it's loosely coupled, and it adds way more complexity because by being loosely coupled, it means that you don't have a contract on the message. So the service A can send a message to, uh, to service B, but service B has a hypothetic idea of what it's going to get and what it wants to do with that message. It adds more complexity because if you don't know what the message may look like, you probably will have some parsing errors, uh, type errors, or whatever, depending on the language and what you want to do with that message. Uh, some benefits, though, is like being loosely coupled. Uh, you can say, I will send this message, and whoever gets this message can do whatever it wants with it. And one of the places where we use this kind of uh, messaging or loosely coupled contract is in Silometer, um, where So Silometer would plug into the notification stream of OpenStack, and it will get all the notifications of what's happening in your infrastructure. If you spawn a new virtual machine, a new notification will be sent, so Silometer gets it, parses it, and does something with it, creates new events, creates stats, and allows you to build users based on what you've done. Um, and one thing about messaging is that it may depend on message routers and transformations. So, when you use messaging and you want to send a message from point B to point C, but you have to go first to uh, point B, you will need in point B some kind of logic or a technology that will allow you to route that message to point C. And you will do that based on the message information itself. You, so you have to know what to do with it, and you have to try to parse it and get information out of it to know where the message has to go. And this is something that Nova Scheduler for example, does. Like, it doesn't get a notification, it gets a, an RPC message, and we'll go to that later. But it gets a new message, it parses it, and it tries to get a Nova Compute node that will do the work for it, and it will send that message to Nova Compute. And it does that by using some filter logics and um, availability and um, other important information. But let's not get to, uh, let's not dive, dive into that. Um, they're very easy, they're very cheap, but they add complexity to your system. And the last method that I want to uh, present today is RPC. And RPC, uh, it, it stands for Remote Procedure Calls. It uh, was probably introduced pretty much by the enterprise war, when uh, system integrators wanted to integrate systems for the customers, and they would go and use RPC calls uh, to, to do that. And RPC calls, the, the way it works is you will send a formatted message, so you have a contract on that message. 
to uh, point B. Point B will do that, and it's called remote procedure call because you're basically calling a remote function just by sending a message. You will say, oh, call this function and pass these arguments to that function and give me the result back. It's the most used uh, method throughout OpenStack, and I do have numbers for this. Um, the message channel may vary. You can use databases, message brokers. So like I said, I'm not talking about, about here I'm not talking about the, the method you would use to send a message from point A to point B. In the OpenStack case, though, we use message brokers to do this, uh, to do RPCs. And one of the uh, drawbacks, but it's actually something required for RPC, is that it's tightly coupled. So you have a protocol. You have to invent something. You have to agree on a contract when you send a message from point A to point B, because you want to call a function that you know it exists in point B, and you have to pass some arguments to that function, and you want to get a result back. So you have to know what are you going to get back, and you have to know what you have to send to the point B to call that function. So it's really tightly coupled. You will need like design your own protocol to do this. Um, but, you know, uh, it's, it's really common, it's very useful for doing uh, that kind of remote calling function thing. But you have your benefits and your drawbacks taken from this. So in the OpenStack case, this is pretty much a high-level overview of, of how OpenStack works in terms of, of system integration. It's based on shared nothing architecture. Uh, if you don't know what shared nothing architecture is, it's basically, in a very simple way, it's services working together but not sharing anything. And by not sharing anything, I mean they don't share uh, memory uh, space on your box, they don't share processes, PIDs and, and, and other resources. Like they can live together on the same box, but they won't share the same resources. They all have their own space within that, that box. So every service knows very few things about other services and, by, and with that, we, we managed to get and to keep all those services very isolated from each other, which is really good if you want to integrate systems together. Uh, you want your services to be independent. You want your services to be isolated from each other. And if something happens to one of your services, you, would see, you definitely want your other services to still be alive and being able to, to work on, uh, on top of other services in your system. So we use databases for inter-service communication. Like I said, Nova, uh, Nova API will store a new instance record with booting state, and then Nova Compute will update that state. And we use RPC for inter-service communication. When Nova API gets a new instance request, it will send an RPC message to, message to the scheduler, and the scheduler will get that message. And then it will send another RPC message to the compute node that will then boot the, uh, the virtual machine. And we use messaging for cross-service communication. And I already mentioned this. The way it works is that services, when something happens with OpenStack, services will generate notification. Notification, then they will send it to some specific topic in, in the broker that other services can just plug into and get messages out of it. And they can do something with those messages. Um, so since OpenStack relies a lot on brokers, and, and it's probably uh, right now, one of the common tools to, to integrate services in, in, in many deployments. Uh, I would like to say a few things about brokers and, and the technologies that you could use or how you could do integration based on, on protocols like AMQP or, or just using technologies like message brokers. So the first thing, first thing I want to say is that scaling brokers is really hard. You've may read or heard something like broker scaling is already fixed and you can scale RabbitMQ. I'm sorry, that's a lie. That doesn't work that way. Um, there's a lot of documentation, yes. There's some explanations how you can do it, yes. There are some demos that people have done it, yet when you get it to big scales, it doesn't work that way. So scaling brokers is hard because synchronizing messages between different nodes of your broker that is heavily read and heavily written on uh, it's really hard, and it doesn't work that way. Another thing is that brokers need a lot of memory. Um, it really depends on your use case. If you don't have many messages traveling around your system, you probably won't use a lot of memory, but if you have a big deployment, your broker is definitely going to use a lot of memory, and it really depends on how fast you write to it and how fast you read from it. If you write really fast and you read uh, as fast as you read, 
uh, sorry, if you, if you read as fast as you write, your broker will probably use uh, less memory. I mean, the, the, the memory uh, footprint will be pretty linear and stable, but if you have more writes than reads, your broker will use a lot of memory. Brokers need a lot of storage, and if you want to have durable queues, and, and you have your messages to stick around if something bad happens, you probably will use a durable queue. If you use a durable queue, your broker will have to write everything on disk. Because if the broker goes down, it has to start from somewhere, right? So it will read all your messages out of the whatever database or, or storage system it is using, and it will make those messages available again. So again, if you have a lot of, read, of writes and, and not as many reads as you have writes, your, your, broker, your broker will use a, a lot of storage. So I was looking at the time, and it says nine minutes because like, LibreOffice uh, uh, went down. I was like, oh, I'm already done. Uh, <laughs> so like, since I've been ranting about brokers for a bit, uh, I would like to say something about those. Uh, if you are going to use brokers or any messaging technology, prefer federation instead of centralization. Uh, what I mean by that is, if you have a centralized broker and you want to scale that broker, and that broker goes down, you're done. Like your system is off. Yeah, you will have HA and all what you want. Like you have, you want to uh, scale a broker and you want to have it replicated and all all those kind of things. But if you prefer federation instead of centralization, you will have a whole bunch of nodes that are like lightweight brokers, uh, workers, and if they go down, you will probably set up a new one, and you won't rely on a single broker that is in the middle of your system uh, processing all your messages. And one way to do that is relying on AMQP 1.0. AMQP 1.0, I'm, I'm pretty sure you, most of you are familiar with AMQP itself. Uh, current latest version of the AMQP protocol being used by RabbitMQ and most of the brokers is MQP 0.10. And MQP 0.10 is not a standard, and many brokers have implemented it in different ways. Uh, whereas MQP 1.0 is actually a standard, and it detects how uh, messages will go from point A to, uh, to point B. So how you can share, send messages from uh, between two peers. Um, MQP 1.0 is peer-based in a message basis. What I mean by that, it, it, takes, it, it explains how a message will travel from a point to another point, but it also, uh, in the specification, there's also an explanation how you would do that with an intermediate uh, broker. So it doesn't say that you have to have a completely federated system, you could also have a broker in the middle that is capable to speak MQP 1.0. So MQP 1.0 is all about messages and how those messages will go from point A to point B. Um, and if you want to scale it uh, and have more routing uh, intelligence, so to speak, in your system, you could use something like QP Dispatch that will allow you to create new rules to send those messages from from between your services, uh, as you would do with using routing keys in MQP 1.10. So in, in MQP 1.0, you don't have exchanges, you don't have queues, you don't have uh, binding rules, and you don't have routing keys. In MQP 1.0, you just have messages, and you have links, and every link is basically a connection to one of the peers in your system. So after having said all that uh, about methods to integrate systems and technologies that you could use and protocols and all that stuff. I would like to give you some tips and tricks about uh, system integrations. This is mostly based on our experience in the open stack community. Um, first and foremost, transmission protocol matters. Um, by transmission protocol, I'm not talking at the lowest level. Like I'm not talking about UDP against TCP. I'm talking about a probably a higher level, like whether you want to use a protocol that's TCP-wide or you want to use HTTP or you want to use some other uh, RPC protocol whatsoever. Um, transmission protocols matter. Uh, depending on the protocol you choose, you have some extra cost on, on, what, on, on your messages and, and transmission of, of your messages. So be aware of that. Uh, depending on your use case, 
make sure you choose the best protocol for your use, your use case. Use versions for your wired protocol. Um, if you choose to use RPC to integrate your systems, you probably will have to agree on a protocol, and you probably have to define that protocol by yourself. Something that uh, has been around in OpenStack for a long time is the version of those protocols. So when you define your protocol, you probably will say, my protocol is a dictionary that I will send uh, between services, and that dictionary has a key that is called function, and that function is the, the key, the value of that key is actually the function name. And then I will have args and key, key, uh, keywords and in the dictionary, and that will be the value to pass to the arguments and keyword arguments of the, my function. But then you want to update that protocol. You say, I want to also specify the return type I want from that function. And if you have, a, if you have your system deployed and you want to make a change to your protocol, you can do that, but if you don't have versioning, you will probably have to tear all your services down and then up again when, once you updated the protocol. Because if some service, gets, some service, like service B, gets a message, an RPC message with a RPC, an RPC format it doesn't recognize, it will probably fail. Instead, if you have versioning, you can do rolling updates on your system by restarting services one at a time and updating those services so you don't have any downtime. Uh, versioning is not just useful for upgrades, it's also useful for uh, backward compatibility. If you do a change and that change turns out to be really bad, you can go back to your previous version and you still have your services that used to work with that version. Keep everything explicit. Um, I have a really nice quote that I got from uh, Jeff Hodge's talk at the RIA conference. He basically said, in a distributed system, having implicit things is the best way to fuck yourself. Um, that's really true. Like, if you have it, implicit things happening in your system, like you send a message and you don't, like an RPC message and you don't agree on the contract of, for that message, you will probably face some subtle issues that you, don't, you didn't expect it to happen. Um, so keep everything explicit. Even if it is more verbose, even if you need more code, even if you need more nodes running, that's fine. Just keep everything explicit because when something bad happens, you will know what it is. You will know how to debug it and how to fix it. Most of the time. Can you step oh, to the microphone, please? Yeah, I can repeat it. Like he's asking for an example of an implicit, oh, I can get one of the open stack issues. Uh, well, see, yeah, like, uh, for a long time, if I recall correctly, Cilometer, use, like, Cilometer uses messages, out, it gets messages out of the uh, notification stream in OpenStack, and there were some implicit fields being sent by some services, and those fields weren't, like, weren't sent by other message services, so Cilometer didn't know about that, and when uh, there was a case where it failed when it got those messages, a uh, good thing is that uh, it was before the release, so it could be fixed. But anyway, you don't, you don't need to, like, something that you want to keep explicit is how you distribute your system, right? How, where your nodes are running and what, what nodes can run alongside with other nodes. You don't want to have all nodes running on the same servers, server, so if you keep your architecture and your distribution very explicit, and even in the way you use separate services, uh, it will be easier for you to estimate the scale and, and how to distribute those. A good example of this is Nova itself, again. Um, Nova has a Nova API service and it has a Nova scheduler service. So if you're getting a lot of uh, API requests, you will get a lot of messages going to your scheduler. So if your scheduler is under a lot of uh, pressure, you can add more schedulers to it and that will uh, do, that. you can scale them horizontally very easily. So the way you distribute your services in terms of, of, of code, like usually you have an API service, a scheduler service, a conductor service, and a compute service, uh, it's another way to be explicit in how your uh, distributed system should look like. Design by contract, and I've been using the word contract a lot today. Uh, if you design by contract, you don't have to, um, like you know what, what service B is expecting you to send, 
and service B is expecting you to send something. So service B can uh, run, let's say, a set of assertions before running anything, and it will be replied back with, if some of those uh, requirements are not met. So uh, to put it another way, uh, when you integrate your system and you want two services to talk together, to talk to each other, you have a contract between them. It's like pretty much like your account manager and yourself. Like you have a contract with him, and you know what he's expecting you to do when you pay something, and he wants you to get all the receipts and give them, give those receipts to him. And you know when you give those receipts to him, he will do something with it, and and you will pay him for that service, and will it, he will expect you to pay for his service, right? So you have a contract with him. The same thing happens with services. When you send a request to service B, uh, service B is expecting something to you, from you. You know what, he, what the service is expecting, so you will send that. If you don't met those requirements, he will reply back with an error. Um, and if you send all the requirements, you are going to expect something back from it. If you don't get what you're expecting, you can just call back again and say like, hey, this was not what I was expecting, so please give me what I want. Um, this uh, design by contract was oh, it's probably known by most of you. It's what, it was introduced by AFL, the programming language, and, and it's basically part of the coding styles of the, of the language itself. Keep services isolated as much as possible. Um, like I said, share nothing architecture is, is very useful when you want to keep your distributed system safe. Uh, from failures, like, and it's not like completely safe from failures, but if one of your services goes down and it's isolated from all your other services, you probably can just run another one somewhere else and just make it talk to them. So keep them isolated, keep, them, you keep your services very, as, very stupid if you can. Um, and I'm not talking about microservice architecture and having like thousands and thousands of microservices doing just one uh, little function thing. But Keep them isolated and very focused and context on, on what they have to do. Avoid dependency cycles between services. So uh, I wouldn't recommend using the star integration method. It's really messy, and when something goes wrong, you, it's very difficult to debug it. So avoid having dependency cycles between your services. If you can have a service bus and you can send messages through it, make sure you don't depend on the, the Both services don't depend on each other to, to get something done. Mock is not testing. If you have a distributed system, you probably want to test it. If you want to test it, you would say, hey, the easiest way to test it is by mocking what I'm expecting from the other service. Yeah, that works, and it probably will succeed every time, but that's not testing. If you want to test your distributed system, get it installed, run everything live, and that's a way to test it. That's how you will know when something is working and it's not working. We have mocks in OpenStack, but we also run everything live for every single patch. Um, and this is very important. Like many bugs we have found in, um, in OpenStack and that are related to how services are distributed were not tested live, and we have mocks for those tests. So mock is not testing. And before closing, uh, since this is a Python oriented conference, uh, here are three uh, libraries for, for doing integrations, like Kombu is for sending messages. Combo uh, is a library is actually used by Celery, and it supports transports, and every transport is basically a messaging technology you could use. You can use RabbitMQ, MongoDB, uh, Redis, and some other sort of technologies that it supports, uh, DuraMQ. Um, Celery is a distributed task manager. Uh, well, there was a presentation before mine about it. Uh, it basically allows you to have distributed workers doing something based on messages, and Celery itself uses RPC implicitly to tell workers what they have to do. And Oslo Messaging is an RPC library, and that's what we use in OpenStack to send RPC messages through services. And it also supports, uh, well, it has the architecture to support many brokers. It just supports RabbitMQ and Cupid for now, and we're working on the MQP 1.0 uh, support for it. And these are some uh, messaging technologies that you could use. Uh, you probably already know them, like Kafka, Marconi, DuraMQ, RabbitMQ, and the Cupid family. You have the Cupid D, which is the broker, and it supports 0.10. And well, it actually supports uh, 1.0 as well. You could, you could use Cupid Proton, which is fully MQP 1.0, and 
QP dispatch for routing messages throughout your system. And that's pretty much it. Any questions? Please, uh, please come to the microphones if you want to ask questions. Go ahead. Hi. Um, thanks for your talk. Um, I was really cur I would be quite curious about um, how do you do your systems integration testing? Like, do you have some also some automated system integration testing of you know setting up a cluster with all the yeah. services and so on? Yeah. And what tools do you? So in OpenStack, we use Gerrit for code review. Every time you submit a patch there, uh, there's a tool, with, which is our testing integration tool. It basically gets notifications from Gerrit, and it runs a Jenkins job every time it gets a new patch. And those Jenkins jobs will install OpenStack completely in a single node, and it will test. There we have live tests that call APIs, and it will send messages throughout the whole system and like simulate a live environment, like spawning new virtual machines, taking it down, creating new volumes, deleting volumes, creating new images and deleting images, and all that kind of things. So it's been tested live. We do have automation, automated tools, like Jenkins is basically the one that does everything. And we use DevStack to install pretty much all the tools in those uh, Jenkins jobs. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Um, I have a question. You, you didn't talk about security. Uh, if, if you run this messaging infrastructure, how do you secure it? Sure. Um, so right now, uh, in OpenStack, uh, security is pretty much done by binding everything on your private network in this layer. We have some work going on on signing messages and encrypting messages before sending them, sending them through the whole uh, um, pipe so to speak. Um, there was a talk about uh, Marconi that, that, that was done yesterday, uh, where one of the things, the good things about Marconi that was presented is that it is good when a message broker is not good enough. Uh, one case is especially security. Like we have guest agents running in virtual machines, and we don't want those guest agents to talk to the central broker. So Marconi would be good for that use case where you can just set up a new service that doesn't have to take a high load of messages in your infrastructure and you will isolate everything from your message broker. So the security that how it's done in OpenStack right now is uh, just by binding everything on the private network and doesn't and we don't allow anyone to talk to that except for the services running in, in the OpenStack deployment. And, and like I said, we have some more going on for to sign messages and encrypt messages uh, before sending them through the wire. Go ahead. Yes, I have another question. Do you have a way to um, make the dependencies between your uh, services visible because um, when I see this communication bus, it looks very clear and uh, simple. You just put a message on the bus and somebody else will get it, but um, in the end, that's just a way to the, for, the, for the services to communicate with each, with each other. Yeah. And um, you can easily build a spaghetti dependency system by just using a very clean bus. Yeah. So how you prevent this? Uh, logically. Uh, like we don't have any uh, any assertion between services that say like, hey, we can depend on each other. It's just done logically when the design decisions are being taken. Like we cannot make service A to depend on service B and service B depend on service A. So let's try to figure out a way to do that, which basically means create a service C, and <laughs> unfortunately. But yeah, uh, it's done logically. Like cycle dependencies, uh, in my opinion, are bad, but they are not always bad, like everything in software. Um, but we try to avoid them as much as possible. And it's all done like logically. We have everything explicit, so since we know which service depend on each other, logically speaking, or function-wise or feature-wise, we know that we cannot create cycles in some of the services, or we try not to as much as possible. Can you use the mic, sorry? And that's uh, explicitly written down somewhere in the code. Yeah, no, somewhere in the code, no. Well, it is in the code, definitely, but we have also documentation about it uh, written on wiki pages and, and the documentation of each other's service. And the operations book, obviously, because you have to know how to deploy the whole thing. Uh, if there are no further questions, I'd like to thank the speaker again. Thanks. And thanks for attending. Thank you.